Hello everyone, welcome back to the podcast um, in um, this great series called Communities Unite. Um, today I'm joined with some some great people um, and well, yeah, we, we, we the main focus of today's episode is chronic illness and sharing our, our stories, like everyone's stories. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be really interesting and uh, like I said up before to everyone, it's going to be really cool and I think we're all going to learn stuff at new because I believe everyone here, um, I think some people might have the same chronic illness but I think more or less people have a different chronic illness, um, which is it's really cool. We all, we'll all go learn stuff today. So first of all, we'll all go do our introductions. Um, I'm going to start with Kimberly because she's first on my screen um, and then we're going to go across. So Kimberly, hello. But I'll take yourself on mute first. <laughs> Okay. Hello, Mason. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Kimberly. I'm 25 years old and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I have the chronic illness scleroderma along with autoimmune diseases, which is Raynaud's and antiphospholipid syndrome. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's great that you're here, Kimberly, um, because we're, we're, I know you have a podcast of your own too. So it's, it's great that we're, we're doing this. Yeah, it so. is. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's really cool. So thanks, Kimberly. Um, Ella? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ella Balassa, and I live in Richmond, Virginia, and I have a chronic and rare disease called cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis is characterized by the buildup of mucus in the lungs that causes Cycles of infection and inflammation over time leads to scar tissue in the lungs and ultimately um, respiratory decline and then a shortened life expectancy due to respiratory failure. And I'm very excited to have this conversation with you all today and share a little bit about my story and learn from all of you as well. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Ella, because um, I do know a little bit of... Um, like your, your chronic illness because I've I've had I think one I might be one episode where where someone had it and it, 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 it's really interesting uh it's gonna be really interesting to hear about your story as well um I'm not sure if this is everyone's first podcast but if not um welcome but but yeah thanks Ella um Morgan hi my name is Morgan Vickers I'm from Denver Colorado I have actually 34 chronic illnesses, so I kind of set the record for a lot of people with that. Um, but it ranges everything from my nervous system to my lungs, to my stomach, to my kidneys and bladder, um, literally every organ system, including my heart, um, my adrenal glands, pancreas, everything is affected. Um, so I have things like interstitial lung disease, gastroparesis, um, I have complex regional pain syndrome, which was my first diagnosis at 11, but um, just everything ranges from every organ system, essentially. So it's just been kind of crazy the last few years. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. You're saying you, you, you've you broken the record for like yeah. most, like, I've, I, like um, I've never known someone to have like 34. So it, it, it's, 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 it's really, um, it's, it's really good you're here to, to, to tell your story, Morgan, because um, I know you went on um, Kimberly's podcast as well. And um, before we arranged all this, she sent me your uh, your episode together. I, I, I had a little look. So thank you for, for, for joining us today. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Yeah. Um, Jess? Hi, my name is Jess. I'm from outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I have... Uh, had Crohn's disease since 2007. Um, my Crohn's disease progressed to the point where I had to have my colon removed in 2019. So I have an ileostomy. Um, so I'm just really glad to be here and just uh, share with everybody our experiences and stories. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's going to be really fun, Jess. And, and thank you for saying um, that you'd like to do this um, because I also have Crohn's too. Um, um, so it, it's, it's, it, it's going to be really interesting to see your, hear about your story a bit more. Um, Harrison. Hi, everybody. My name is Harrison Clark. I'm 23 years old, uh, representing Boston. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I'm not personally uh, affected by chronic disease, but I am a caregiver um, for two individuals who have chronic disease. Um, 
One would be my best friend who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, neurodegenerative disorder, and for my mother who has autoimmune disorders that has been scoped around somewhere around lupus, but I, I feel like with a lot of people with autoimmune, um, they know the diagnoses are not always um, 100% spot on. A lot of times they're guesses, but well, we're, when we're sharing our stories, I'll we'll jump more into that um, and how you know we really troubleshoot and kind of really get a good idea of what we're dealing with. And we're, cause there's so many things that they tell you it could be and then it could not be. And then when you finally get something that you can kind of hold on to, um, it's kind of quick that they win with that treatment. So excited to hear about your stories and, and share a little bit about mine as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, f- f- thanks, Harrison. I think it, 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 it's it's really good that you're like here because um like like, like, like you say like you don't have one yourself, but y- you support others that do. So it, it's 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 really good that you're doing that. Yeah. Um. So um. So I think ha- it's a good way to start. Um. So if if like um if. Uh, if we go on to maybe talk about our stories in more depth so um like um i guess maybe first of all we could talk about like does anyone remember um i know i know morgan you have 34 um so it, 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 it may be, be a bit harder for you to remember um but um does anyone remember like how what their first thought was when they got uh, a chronic illness kimberly So my journey with chronic illness started at the age of eight. I was misdiagnosed with Raynaud's because there's an issue when you get like an autoimmune disease. If it's in the earlier stages, like it's hard to like diagnose you, right? So I wasn't formally diagnosed with scleroderma and Raynaud's until 12. So those four years were like a headache because, you know, going from doctor to doctor, trying to explain that this is what I'm feeling and then feeling like misunderstood by doctors. And I think that's why it's so important to advocate for ourselves. I completely agree. Because like doctors, like you, you'd think like, um, it's, it, I guess it's really hard to trust people, isn't it? With your chronic illness, because you have to trust them. Like, um, um, like if you're having surgery or, or something like that and, like um, you're on a certain medication that dampens our immune systems, um, that it, it's really hard because you have to trust them, but it's really hard to trust someone. If, if some little thing goes wrong and if someone's not really cut or caught up really fast, like your chronic illness could rapidly de- like get worse. Or... Yeah. Um, yeah. If I could just add on to that, can we like, I was saying beforehand, especially with things such as autoimmune, because the effect is so like whole body in some cases that you'll be told you have one autoimmune disorder and be set up on this whole treatment. And when my mom was going through her um, period of doctors and testing and everything, the medication that they were giving her made her feel so awful. It made her heart raise, you know, feeling super fatigued. And it was so detrimental. We're like, are we actually really treating what's even going on? Because there's so much speculation. Oh, you have lupus. Oh, no, you have, you know, rheumatoid. And then it's not lupus. And then it's something else. And it really makes you so much more nervous to even see another doctor. Because what what answer am I going to get this time? It's either going to prolong my, my care plan, my treatment plan, or, you know, throw another loop in the, in the journey and just spiral off something that's even more like terrifying um and I feel like that was the most worrying thing for me as like as a son is just to not know what's going on like just to know that something's wrong uh, and then just never have a definitive answer um so I can only imagine like what it's like to personally be in those like shoes but I just you know just all support in the world yeah yeah I completely agree I, I, I completely agree there Harrison it's um it, it's it's very hard isn't it because um like getting diagnosed is hard um isn't it and i i i i personally think it's probably one of the hardest things um like parts of your journey i guess like you get diagnosed um because you don't know you don't know what's going on um you you may not have heard of your your chronic illness before um 
like um like is there is there actually anyone here that ha did hear of of their pacific or any of their um cr chronic illnesses before because i know that's very rare to, to know no one yeah um it would be helpful though wouldn't it if we did <laughs> um we, if, if, if we did though before it would have been much easier um i guess at, at the start and um it goes faster um yeah i was like i don't i didn't have any awareness of my disease because I, I mean i was diagnosed at 18 months old so i was a baby um and it's a genetic disease so my parents are both carriers of the disease um and so recessive genes so Nobody in my, once I was diagnosed, you know, my, my parents were like, well, I, I, they'd never heard of cystic fibrosis before. Nobody in my family or extended family had ever been diagnosed before either. So, um, you know, it's, it's actually one of the more common rare diseases. Um, there's about like 40,000 people with CF in the United States um, and about 70,000 worldwide. But even so, um, you know, there's, there's not much knowledge of it. And now with you know, I wasn't diagnosed at birth, but now in a lot of states, and um, it might be actually across the U.S., there's um, newborn screening for cystic fibrosis. So that really helps to, you know, have that diagnosis much sooner and then be able to begin that treatment uh, as quickly as possible. Because that was something that, like, you know, I struggled in infancy and in very, you know, in as a toddler, like I was, you know, having failure to thrive because I was not getting enough you know, CF affects the pancreas. So I wasn't absorbing my food. I was very underweight. I was having a lot of like Ill respiratory infections and, you know, all that could be really, um, whole, you know, stopped, I guess, earlier or not, not allowed to, you know, manifest um, if, if it could be caught sooner. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Like, I, I agree with what you're saying there, Ada, because like, I guess if you're diagnosed early, um, it's better for the future. Um, but um, yeah, it, it like on the other hand, if you think of the other side, like if if may possibly if you're diagnosed later in life, you may have may have a better maybe growing up without having to deal with all these kind of things. You have to deal with with, with a chronic illness, like uh, maybe um, it was really hard at school or, or making friends as well. Um, because making friends is hard as it is if you have a chronic illness. I think. <laughs> um, but um but yeah um it, it 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 but do you think um like because of course you Ella you, you wouldn't have started um talking about it when you were eight months old would you <laughs> um so when did you kind of start thinking I'm going to kind of spread awareness of like your chronic illness um it was it was certainly a progression over time right as I started to you know, throughout my life, I've had many hospitalizations, a lot of healthcare experiences and encounters. So I learned to see the value of self-advocating for my health and being involved in my care, understanding treatments, and you know, how, being able to communicate with my physicians, with you know, the pharmacy, with all these other stakeholders that you know were helping to facilitate my care. And from there, you know, I realized my value as a patient who could understand and have this interaction and be a co-partner uh, in, in my healthcare. And so in not to share too much of the story, because I want to have, a, I want to let a chance other people to talk as well, but um, I received an experimental treatment um, in 2019. And up until that point, I mean, I'd been active in my own care, but getting that experimental treatment and navigating that with directly with researchers and not through my doctor really gave me the insight into how valuable it is that I was as aware about treatment options, that I was, you know, as aware about research and things that are happening for the treatment of CF and infections in my lungs. And so, and I had the ability to navigate that and make that decision, the informed decision to get this treatment. And so I, that really made me that really solidified my passion and my goals for advocating for empowerment of, of patients to, you know, be these active persons in our care and to gain this knowledge. And so that's how, that's part of like my advocacy work is I really try to 
encourage, inspire, and empower other, you know, other patients and other people living with chronic diseases, rare diseases, to, um, you know, be be active, act, take active roles in their healthcare and learn learn about it, so that they can improve their health outcomes. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree, and I think it's really important that we do know about our own health. Um, even more so than maybe the doctors do, because they 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 could do something that you don't agree with, and it it, it could it's it, like like we said before, it's very hard to trust people. But um, if you get that one person you do trust, and um, um, you might have a few um arguments maybe with them <laughs> at, at time to time. But um, as long as you get what you want and and you think what, what's right, that's the main thing. Um. Morgan, I, I I I'd just like to talk about like your your kind of story a little bit because like like you said that um you have multiple um cro- chronic illnesses uh, like do you want to kind of maybe talk about like maybe maybe from the start um like how how that your story kind of begun and stuff? Sure. So um I started first getting symptoms when I was about like eight or nine years old. And it would be things like just, I couldn't really eat food or um, it just was like, we thought it was gluten intolerant and stuff, but every time we would do a celiac test or a gluten intolerance test or lactose or any of the allergies, um, nothing would really pop up and stuff. So it took honestly from that age to about 11 to where I got my first diagnosis, which had absolutely nothing to do with my digestive system at all. Um, and I was, I broke my foot, um, and it just turned all different colors, swelled up really bad. Um, but it wasn't like such a severe break that would warrant that response. So it took about a year from there to get diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome. Um, from there, my body decided to do, uh, what it does best, which is that it does itself. And it, um, it turned into full body with organ involvement, CRPS. And so from there, I just carried that diagnosis all throughout high school. And then in college, um, I started noticing that I was losing a lot of weight. I had a kidney infection that wouldn't go away. Um, It just severe stuff, it turned into sepsis. It turned into me needing to actually have my kidney removed due to it being severely atrophic. And after that point, just little things would start to pop up. Like my digestive system started failing again and Um, from there, it took another several years for me to get diagnosed with gastroparesis. Um, once I was able to get involved with National Jewish, which is a local hospital in Denver, um, they're well known for their pulmonary division and everything. They're the number one hospital for respiratory in the country. Um, they started just diagnosing me with stuff because every time they would, like, I would have so many symptoms and so many different things pop up that were, um, inconsistent with one another. And so they started noticing that I had things like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, dysautonomia, um, the gastroparesis went with that, the mast cell activation syndrome with, went with that. Um, but then I started developing diseases with like my lungs, which is the interstitial lung disease um, that I have. I have the organizing pneumonia type. And again, my body outdid itself. I've actually been, spent the last 22 days out of 35 in the hospital this last month. Um, and it essentially put me on oxygen. I have a feeding tube. I have two spinal cord stimulators and I'm about to get a pacemaker for sinus um, dysfunction. And it just, basically you stick me in a scan, you draw some blood, something will pop up. Um, I'm very consistent with being able to grab a diagnosis just because I, I just, my blood markers pop up with something. My CT scans pop up with something, Um, you know, just anything. It's very easy to diagnose me. And um, it's been kind of difficult just because I am in the last three years, I went from having like a semi, you know, normal life. Like I was able to still function, finish my degree, you know, do all those sort of things to then having like debilitating chronic illness to then having life-threatening chronic illness. And so um, it just went from zero to 100 in the last three years. And um, that's essentially just what happened to me. I have a disease that um, Kimberly has, I have renounced as well. 
And um, I have a couple autoimmune conditions just with like Hashimoto's, nothing like super, super major or anything with that, but um, just a couple of those sort of things. But that's essentially my story. Yeah, f f f thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, it's, it, it, it's very interesting because um, like you say, like you're always there and, and, and something's always happening. Um, like it seems in, in your journey. Um, so, like when was the last time you was diagnosed like with um, a chronic illness? Um, that, this week, this last week. Oh, oh, it was this week. Yep. So I went in um, to see my electrophysiologist and um, I essentially thought we were going to talk about my dysautonomia and my POTS and everything. And he was like, no, you actually have sinus node dysfunction and you need to have a pacemaker put in. And I was like, oh, OK, so I guess we're doing that. Um, and essentially, though, I'm excited for that just because it should help a ton with so many of my organ systems, like once we get my heart pumping the right way and everything. So um, it should help. And I'm really excited to feel even just 10% better. That's what we've been working for for the last three years is just 10% better so that I can at least, you know, make my own bed every morning and like, you know, maybe not be on oxygen all the time or, you know, you know, whatever. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it must be very um annoying. Like you have to, it, it's like you always have to do that. And then you have to probably go into quite like to see go to the hospital quite a lot of the time for all these different things yep yep it's it's been insane honestly yeah yeah um um yeah I, I, it, 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 that, that's the annoying thing isn't it about when you have um um a chronic illness and, and multiple in your case um like um always happen to go and get uh, like hospitals and stuff like that um do, do, like having lots of like um like um different things like, like like you morgan does that mean you have to be on lots of medication as well yes so i take um so i take 26 medications in a pill form i do shots every month and then i also have um like three different inhalers and the nebulizer that i have to use every day so yeah, yeah. but it keeps me going so you do what you gotta do yeah, I, 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 I don't take as many as that, but I do take um like things every day as well. Um, I I have my little block Monday to Sunday, um, and uh, like just so I don't forget. And sometimes I do, um, it like um, which is not good, but <laughs> I guess you forget a lot, don't you, when you have chronic illness? Yeah, I keep it all in like a little tub and everything, and then I just remind myself with like a million alarms on my phone. And I'm like, it's so annoying for everybody around me because my alarm's going off like every couple hours. But I'm like, it's how I remember. So that's how I do it. Yeah, it's yeah, that's really interesting, Morgan. And like, um, like I'm glad you even have the time to to come on a podcast after like like you you, you get diagnosed or like last coming week, and 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 you're here. So I, I'm I'm. I can't believe that, Morgan. You, you, you've even taken out your time to come on the podcast today. I'm very glad to be here just because, like I said, I was in the hospital 22 days out of the last 35. And when we were organizing this, I wasn't sure I'd be able to do it because I wasn't sure if I'd be in the hospital or not. So I'm very glad to be here. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you're here. And we'll, we'll definitely come back and, and talk more about your story because it's, it's, it's really like um, interesting. I think I think I see I see people in the chat as well like agreeing with that. So um, thank you to Morgan. Um, thank you. Um, Jess, do you want to talk a little bit about like your Crohn's journey so far? Yeah, sure. So I was uh, diagnosed back in 2007. So I think we're all old enough to remember when you were too afraid to hit the internet button on your phone because you were going to be charged like a million dollars. <laughs> so it wasn't like I could sit in the hospital and Google it, you know, like um, like you can kind of do now. So. Um, I was 14 when I was diagnosed and this, and no sooner did she get disease out of her mouth. Was I like, when am I going to die? Like, that was the first thing I thought of. Cause you hear the word disease and it's like, that's it. Like, what, what am I going to do now? Um, and back then in 2007, there was really only one medication and that was Remicade. I don't know if you've been on Remicade Mason, but, um, Remicade infusions was it. If nothing else worked for you, Remicade was the golden ticket. Um, which I ended up being on Remicade. I was in and out of the hospital pretty much for a whole summer. I'm just trying to figure out, 
how to get my symptoms under control. Um, and then that's kind of brought me to my career. I became a nurse, um, because of my disease, I was in and out of the hospital so much. And I was in a children's hospital, um, and there, they were just so wonderful to me. It just brought me to my career. So, um, I ended up actually working, um, in a GI office where I was the one that did the prior authorizations and received the phone calls from patients that had, um, IBD. Um, and it really opened my eyes to that side of chronic illness is, you know, where being a patient is hard enough, but on the other end to the healthcare professionals, it's kind of easy to forget that we're all kind of on the same team. Sometimes um, the doctors want you to have these medications pretty much just as bad as you do uh, most of the time, but unfortunately it's very um, insurance driven. So I think it was really a great experience for me. I luckily work from home now, which has been so much better for mentally, physically, it's just been so much better for me now, but working in that environment, it really um, showed me the other side of uh, what we have to deal with. We only see one side, healthcare professionals see the complete other side. So just um, getting that appreciation for the amount of teamwork that goes into just one medication, let alone, you know, approving multiple medications. So, um, and then also going through the surgical side of everything too, with getting my ostomy and it just makes me a better patient advocate, um, especially in the IBD community, because I've been through pretty much all of it. Um, surgeries, medications. I think I've been on every Crohn's med known to man. I'm on um, Stellara every four weeks with budesonide every day now. And that keeps me good enough to function. Um, but yeah, so my career kind of brought me kind of like, um, Ella brought me into advocacy. It brought me into my career. So I just think it's so important to have conversations like these where, yeah, we might all have different illnesses, but in the end, we're all fighting for the same thing and fighting for, you know, um, our access to everything be easier and that, that we don't feel alone. Cause I think that's the biggest part of having a chronic illness, especially when you're diagnosed young is, um, most of us have been in and out of the hospital multiple times. You have to miss birthday parties and vacations. And we actually um, had to leave halfway through my family vacation to come home because I was so sick. Um, and that's just one of those things through time you get more used to it. But when you're young, that's like, you never are going to make that up to your family. Like you were, you just kind of carry that around with you. So I love having these conversations with people because even though our illnesses are different, we all can use each other for support. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Jess. I am um, like with with like your, your infusion. I I I I was on an infusion um, called Infliximab, which I think is, is very similar, or the, or the UK name to um, to um, your infusion, um, which I was on for a year, and mm -hmm. I, I was I was in, I was enjoying it, and I um, well, I did have the option. Um, to go on Himera first, but I didn't want to because I, it, I was I was really quick. I, it was not that long after I was diagnosed, and I wanted to be like in the hospital care, um, like as a hospital rather than me going at home and and not like you can basically just do it on your own. And and I guess that, that, that that's nice, but it worked out well for me because um, I had the reaction on the tenth infusion, and you know every time you have an infusion, if you're doing it right. You can they they might go a little bit faster with how they do, how 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 long it goes, and you can go home quicker, which which was nice. And then um on on the in on the temp infusion um you know when you have your loading dose when you have an infusion for the first fifteen minutes, um I um I, I had a reaction there and um like like you had the um my arm felt really warm um like and uh. I just thought it was warm in the room at the first first thing, um, and then after it, I felt really hot, um, and then I thought oh, so someone weren't, weren't right here, and um, like there, there was like three or four nurses in the room, so they were really good, um, mm. and then what happened was, um, um, I I I was struggling to breathe, and then I needed oxygen, um, um, well, it's the first time I ever needed oxygen, um, so it that. That they want the best, and then I'm thinking to myself, when what, we're not going to continue this, I, I I'm going to go probably home now because it's not working. And then um, what they did was they um, they just spoke to my um, my consultant, and he says um, to continue it, but very slowly. Um, so like really, 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 really slow. Um, yeah. And I still thought, oh okay, but I did see him the like next one or two days afterwards, where then I was put on hero, 
So um, I've, 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 I'm still on him here now, but it, it like it's it's it kind of feels like the end of the world when a medication doesn't work for you, doesn't it? Yeah, and like, and I know it's just the medical word, and it's kind of the insurance word. But when they say that you failed a medication, sometimes that's kind of disheartening too, because it's not you know it's not your fault, but it kind of feels like your fault. I know that's kind of the medical term for it. If it doesn't work, is fail. Um, but sometimes that can kind of feel, I don't know, kind of crappy from your end, you know, like you're like, oh, they told me this medication is going to work. I did exactly like you said, I did exactly what they told me to do and it still didn't work. So sometimes that can be the most frustrating thing is even if you know there's more options, just knowing that that one option didn't work can just kind of, kind of be disappointing in the moment. Definitely. Definitely. And like you guys talk about quite a lot of the time and, um, Morgan, I know you mentioned about like bl- blood as well, and like um, I know we all probably have to go for for blood tests quite a lot of the time, um, because that's what happens when you have a chronic illness. You have to all get these checks, um, and um, you know when when I get when someone says to me, I don't know if anyone else here is the same, but um, w- w- depends how good your veins are, um, and it, it, if you have good veins, or um, they, they 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 always tell you, don't they? They always say drink a lot before you go for your blood test um and I always make sure I do um so I'll drink a litre or two I'll probably need a loo a half a dozen times but I'll, I'll, I'll have as much drink as I can and then if a nurse says to me they, they, they say Mason um it's not it's not working I, I can't find anything I, I would say what do you mean I've, I've drunk all this water and you say it's not working <laughs> um which I am pretty good in the veins um and then um I don't know about any anyone else, but when I go for an injection, it might be a Crohn's injection or chronic illness injection. It may be a blood test, but I am very more comfortable with someone I recognise. R- r- nothing against maybe a newbie, but but if they um if they're like taking maybe five six minutes on, on trying to get the needle in, you, you think to yourself, are there, is something going to go wrong here? That's a hundred percent. And I, I there's a couple of things because just what you were saying earlier about it being such an insurance dominated like space, especially when seeking treatment, like having to fail that first medication, even though you know like this first medication isn't going to be a good fit for me, just having to check that box before you're able to move on to something else. So frustrating. And so I think out of touch with the actual experience of so many people. And then as far as the needles and everything goes, my best friend who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, he has a, an access port like, like on his chest, all right? And so it is a whole, he's a whole ritual when he, ha- when he gets it access, T-shirt over his head, no noise, just like go in, stick it, and then it's done. If you miss that one chance, if you miss that one, it's over. He's not gonna, he's not gonna let you do it again. He's not gonna give you a minute. And it's completely, it's, it's done, it's a done deal. My mom's the same way. If you have to fish for the vein, she goes, nope, take it out, get it somewhere new, I'm not doing it. I think it's just a level of comfortability that, you know, we need to have with our own bodies to express we're not feeling comfortable with being medically. It's always that, am I wrong for telling you to stop or like not wanting to try again? I say 100% no, you're not. Like it's your body, feel comfortable in it. And um, I just wanted to champion that and, and big ups to you, Jess, for, for chiming in about that insurance part because it's so, so huge. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Harrison. Um, yeah, because um, it's like, I guess at the same time, you, it's hard to even say for a person to stop doing what, and, and they're mind they're thinking they're helping you, but I, I, on the other hand, you, if you're really uncomfortable with something, um, you, you, you're you to probably be as nice as you can, but you just, like sometimes you've got to try and say, uh, stop. Um, and fortunate, I was able to do that once because, uh, it was at an infusion um like um this new person uh, was a, i think a, a new nurse and like a person i'm used to said could this new person try um put your cannula in and as we know cannulas aren't very comfortable as things are they <laughs> um and um i said yes cuz i am nice so I'll, 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 I'll let them try on me um 6 minutes later <laughs> um it, it felt longer. I say six minutes. If it, it does feel longer, but um, let's say six minutes later, she's still trying to do it. And then uh, um, I, I, I say, I, I say, um, 
What's taking so long? Uh, and then um, they say, um, I'm still trying to find your vein. Uh, have, have, have you drunk enough water today? Um, I say, um, yeah, yeah, I drank enough water. <laughs> um, and then I don't think I had the courage to say it. I think it was a family member who actually said, um, what's taking so long? Because um, I struggled to even say them to stop. Um, but and then she was moved on um, to to another patient, which gladly I gladly that was the case because um, um, something happened. She put the vein. No, she put the needle not in the vein. She put it. Uh, she, it didn't go in the vein, so she had to stay longer because it, it was disrupted. And I think her fusion was really disrupted and everything. So um, it's it's really important, isn't it? Like just to speak out when you feel uncomfortable, especially like in a, in like if you're having injections and and stuff. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, Harrison, we. I know you briefly said it at, like at the start about like um like about you helping people, but do do you want to go into that maybe a little bit more um like in more depth a little bit? Uh, just about being a caregiver. Yeah. Oh man, the it's probably one of the biggest honors I've probably ever experienced. Like as as because I I start I started off when I was really like sixteen, fifteen years old. And not being like officially like a personal care assistant, but just like appreciating someone that I had met like out of nowhere that was so unique, that was so committed to laughing and having enjoying life, no matter what the circumstances were, and just wanting to like help that, like um, help them be as as well and as as good as possible. Um, so I've learned a lot especially at you know the young age of 23 years old just patience is a huge thing um I, i'm so patient um just really listening and um like not taking things personally uh and and just having a really open-minded um view of just what's going uh, what's going on really with with everything they're feeling because I, I i might be able to like sympathize but i don't have that real experience of like this is what's going on um so i i've enjoyed being his arms his legs reaching things when he can't get it you know opening his food for him um there was one time um, he wanted to set up a fish tank and the fish tank was downstairs Right, and there's not a wheelchair ramp that gets downstairs into the basement. So he, you know, spent all his time saying fish tank. He got all his fish in there, but was just unable to see it. So it was just like, what do I do as like, you know, the best friend? And like, I picked him up, carried him downstairs, and you know, I, you know, brought the chair so he could sit sit there and watch the fish. And um, he was so happy. It really, it still does like really make me tear up because it's really just the small things like being able to enjoy things that you that you just you just like and just being able to be a part of someone's someone's uh, experience like that it's just really awesome I, I think it is too and it, it, it it's good that like you you want to do that um like you 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 want to support someone and um, who, who needs that um who needs the support um because I think it, it like it, it's very hard for, for 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 people who have um a chronic illness to people to understand them um like um accept them even um i think um because like um especially these last few years it's 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 it's, it's been really hard hasn't it um with events going on in the world and, and still are um which which i think a lot of people do forget um who maybe don't have a um a chronic illness or or on the illness themselves um because with COVID, yeah yeah definitely. not being able to see all of my all my friends who are sick and just relying on FaceTime and not wanting to get them sick, but like really missing that one-on-one -on -one time to like laugh at TV shows, or like go get tacos and like bottomless margaritas or something like that. It, it, it was it was a really tough time, but I'm glad things are getting a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, it, it's like with the isolation, like within COVID, that is what... Um, I think people who have chronic illness are like anyway. Like you have to, you have to be inside. You have to, um, 
protect yourself um because like and even so um like maybe people could um similar in ways where you have to be really isolated and um but it's it, it like it if you do things like this guys we'll we'll, we'll be helping someone at least <laughs> yeah um so with um chronic illness um so um with um like our journeys um what do you think the highlight is like why do you think we do this what why do we like talking about it like um like what do you think we kind of get out of talking about our journeys um kimberly sorry i keep forgetting to unmute my button but what I get out of it is like, I want to show people that you can still live a good life, even though you have a chronic illness. I would just want to inspire people and I want to show them, yeah, there's going to be tough times, obviously, but there's going to be great times too. And I think it's all about perspective. And that's what I want to share my story and, you know, show people that having a stroke is not the end of the world. I mean, I'm still alive. And, you know, I just met Ella the, uh, when was it like July for patients rising? Um, I met Morgan through TikTok. I met Harrison through patients rising thing. I mean, it's amazing. Once you put yourself out there, you meet amazing people that you're probably going to be friends for with the, for the rest of your life. I, I completely agree. Um, because like 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 at the beginning, the only person I've seen before here is, is Kimberly, and it 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 is it, it, it's nice because like you got Ella, you got Morgan, you got Jess, you got Harrison, all all um all sharing your stories as well. Because like um I I think it, what makes this really cool is because we all have some different like like Kimberly has um a, a different kind of illness to Ella, Ella has different one to Morgan, and and Morgan to Jess, and uh, so on and on which I, I think is really cool because uh, like you only, I think um, when you have a chronic illness, um, chronic illness is, I should say, um, you only want to know about th the ones you have, I guess. And then like until someone else shows an interest about learning about your specific chronic illness, it, it's really cool. It's really rewarding, isn't it? That you get to share your story with, with other people. I, I'd have to agree with with Kimberly on that. It was, it's so great to meet people, you know, that, you know, they do struggle in different ways, yet we have that mutual understanding of, you know, facing adverse, adversity, um, overcoming it. Yeah, sharing in the lows, although they look different, you know, so all of that really like brings us closer uh, as a community, you know, as a, as a, patient community as, as a group of people, um, you know, who, who have that or are united by that. Um, and I also just want to, I didn't have a chance before, but I wanted to add to or comment on, you know, Harrison's sharing his, his experience as a caregiver and, um, and how grateful I am for those in my life who have helped um, you know, care for me and provided me that support, you know, whether that is my family and friends and, you know, even those that are not, I don't even know that personally, but who, um, you know, when I share my story online, they reach out to me and, you know, um, you know, support me in, in so many ways. And that is something that is so uplifting and it, 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 it improves or it contributes so much to, our well-being, overall well-being, you know, contributes to our mental health and which is, I think, is a huge mental health and physical health are so closely intertwined um, and, you know, supporting both is equally important. And so, um, you know, just thank you, Harrison, for all you do for, for your friend and your and your mother and everybody else that you that you care for. So, you know, we, you know, as people living with, with chronic diseases and, you know, we, we need that uh, and it, it's very much appreciated. Yeah, I I I I completely agree with with, with, with you there, Ella, and I think everyone does as well because like more people like Harrison and and who, who do that kind of stuff, it's 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 really good because it, it just supports like different people and in, in their own ways. 
Yeah, I feel like it's important too, because I feel like we've all many times in our life felt like burdens. Um, we're holding other people back. People are canceling their plans because we had to cancel our plans because we don't feel good. And um, it, uh, Harrison, that made me very emotional when you said it was such an honor for you to do that. Kind of like what Ella was saying, you know, it's, you feel like a burden at least a million times throughout your journey. And to hear someone just say that they are just so willing to help someone else. It just kind of makes you, makes you grateful if you do have caregivers and it makes you even more grateful for the ones out there um, that do that job. Cause it's a hard one. Um, like, you know, mental, physical, emotional health is all a huge part of it. And to have somebody that you can go to and know that you can go to is so important with caregivers. And it's important for us too, when in this community, you know, um, finding kind of like I was saying earlier with other people, you have different chronic illnesses, but we we are not alone in this. It kind of feels that way sometimes, but um, just knowing that we're not alone and that we can reach out to each other for support is something that's so huge. So even when we do have caregivers, no one really understands chronic illnesses like people who have chronic illnesses. So um, having uh, amazing people in the world to be able to talk to is just incredible. Yeah, I agree with everyone with your comments on Harrison, just because, I mean, for me personally, like I, if I didn't have my mom, like as my caregiver, I would, I wouldn't be able to drive. I wouldn't be able to take care of myself, go to appointments. I wouldn't be able to do really anything at all. And, um, it also made me emotional when you said that it was an honor because it just, I mean, I think there are caregivers who are out there who really do like the best and the brightest for who they care about. And then there are also people who are not so fortunate. And so I think it's really great that you see it that way and that you are doing that for your mom and your friends, just because, I mean, it is so appreciative. And it does like, even though you personally can't understand what it's like to like feel the physical side of like what we feel as a chronic feel person, but you do see it and you experience it in a way that we can't experience. And you have a whole new appreciation for what it's like to, um, to feel this way and everything, even if you're not the one specifically like feeling those symptoms and stuff. So it is very appreciative. And I mean, as far as it goes with like being able to have these conversations with other people who are chronically ill, I think that's so important just because it can be isolating. Um, but it, when you really look at it, like everyone else was saying, it's, you know, you can still have a good life and have chronic illness and you can still like experience like really great things and everything. So it's like, you know, having these conversations is great because I think that it tears down kind of those stigmas and stuff of like, you have to look a certain way, feel a certain way, like be a certain way, you know, because somebody else who is not chronically ill puts you in that position to feel that way. So I think these conversations are great for tearing down stigmas and also for just, you know, feeling less alone and everything. I completely agree with you, Morgan. And I can see everyone else does too. And um, like, um, I, I, I'm I'm glad that like everyone else has shared like um like the, their stories and and like how everyone agrees like um how emotional it was when, when Harrison said it, it was an honor because you don't get that much do you like um anyone say it's an honor to um to help someone um especially with a, a chronic illness and um and I think like someone helping someone with a chronic illness or an illness like like we were, like you um you mentioned like mental health which can be really affected because you've got to be I guess on the ball like you you have to know um maybe like in, in maybe for for Harrison you 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 may need to like you will need to know quite a lot about maybe your your, your friend and and your mum and and like what, what they are going through so it's like it's it's it must be really like I guess at times tough on your on on you and 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 on your mental health. Yeah, and the the biggest thing, and um, this has been my experience with the chronic disease community, the rare disease community, in uh, most of these spaces, is that there's so much grace to make mistakes and to not um, get it right the first time. And to be like, I wasn't the best personally at that point, but I'm like, I'm committed to being that for you. And I felt like, especially because a lot of times it's been such an uncertain moment. Like there's been 
times where I was in middle school or high school and I thought my mom was going to die. Like, it was just so scary. Like, just imagine your mom, just you get a call, your mom's been hospitalized. She had a seizure and she has pancreatitis and, you know, her blood is like this and like that. And just going there and just seeing your mom laid out in absolute agony, not having any idea what's going on. Um, and then to also like understand the ways in which like race and healthcare have played like such a role in like my black mother feeling like she's being hurt or being like she's taken care of or might feel like she's being like taken advantage of like seeking care. Um, it's so much that I think mentally you have to process and be aware of. Um, just as when I'm working with my friend, um, I wasn't the only caregiver. There were others that weren't the best um, that I felt were a little, uh, not uh, the best people to have around. Um, and I really did my best to one, stop the behavior and two, just to reinforce that like whatever is needed, I'm there. There to be like an emotional support. I'm your friend at the end of the day. And you know, friends are gonna be there for you through thick and thin. Um, they're gonna tell you when you're wrong, they're gonna, you know, support you when you're right. And I've just been really grateful to one have such an amazing mother that really instilled um this compassion and this um, ability to give of myself the way that I do and to also have found a friend that um, really appreciates me and uplifts me and um, you know it's, it's, it's not too hard on me when I'm when I'm wrong and able to give me that grace so I, I thank you all you guys are making blush but I, I really appreciate um, all, all the all the good stuff so thank you yeah, I I see some um I'm seeing my hearts going up there, so I I think uh, uh <laughs> we're all making sure I blush here, uh, Harrison. <laughs> um, but it's it, it's a very um personal topic, isn't it? Um, because like um you wouldn't like every day just talk to someone about this kind of stuff. It, it it's very like personal, and I I, I think like with with the size like mental health and health that um it's like it's very hard to let out your emotions as well I think um because like um like if you if you want to have a little cry uh it's it's, it's like it, it may be you're in a public place in a hospital for example and something's really painful and you, you don't want to cry because there's people you're not used to around you or like old doctors and you don't want to cry in front of them because you you want to be brave or you, you want to be a brave person um and um it's hard because like you try to hold it in um and I guess you don't want sympathy for from from people as well um but it, it, it's hard isn't it just to let those emotions out um uh, when you're going through a tough time or a family member a friend is going through a tough time because you want to be that strong person but you can't all the time you have to you have to cry I think sometimes yeah it's 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 it's, it's hard but um like I think crying is good for you as well as uh, as well as it's not it's not great but if you cry sometimes it's you let all those emotions out that you feel inside and 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 stuff like that um and I think like speaking about mental health that I think these last couple of years um especially since COVID started I think it's got talked about a bit more than it was before I think um. Like with um like um cr chronic illness um how do you think um like do 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 you guys think there's enough support there like it like um like in the chronic illness like community um or or do you think like um there needs to be more support around maybe certain areas um Kimberly. I think there is enough support, like if you put yourself out there and you actually look for it, because before when I used to be in a bubble and not talk to anyone, of course, there was no support. But once I started sharing my story, once I started being more open to people, I found that other people are willing to support me in ways that, you know, 
kind of like what Harrison said, like a different, they don't have a chronic illness, but they're there just for support. And I absolutely love it. That's why I share my story. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very rewarding, isn't it? Just sharing your story. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, because if, if we didn't share our story, guys, we wouldn't be here now, would we? <laughs> like, um, we wouldn't know each other, I guess. Um, but, um, sharing your story it's good because like I don't know I didn't know about um any of yours well I I knew what I, of course I I, I knew what you what your, your your chronic illness was um but um I didn't know about your personal journeys which it's it's good because like um it's not every day you, you hear about um especially in a group like this different people's journeys and different chronic illnesses because like like you say um like like I think what people don't know is like you could have more than one like Morgan here or, or because like, like I think one is bad enough but having more than one it can be really affect mentally I think as well because um because like um I guess the plus Morgan on your side of things is like um which is not really a plus in a way but I guess it's helpful like like, like you get like you said that you can get diagnosed pretty easily because you've got like um like when you go for tests and stuff I think that's maybe a plus but at the same time I guess it like it really I probably affects you maybe mentally that you're always getting diagnosed with with, with different chronic illnesses it's kind of a catch-22 because like on one hand it's very validating to like know that you're sick and then like get that diagnosis and then you're like okay yeah so I'm validated in like the fact that I knew I was sick and now I have this diagnosis but on the other hand when you start racking up, like I literally told my friends, I was like, once I hit 30 chronic illnesses, I'm throwing a party. Like, I don't, and I haven't been well enough to throw that party yet, but we're going to get there because it's like, you got to make fun of it because it's like, otherwise it can be very daunting and very um, intimidating to like, know that you have 34 chronic illnesses. And so it's kind of like one of those things where it's like, on one hand, yes, it's validating. On the other hand, I'm also like, okay, when is this going to stop? Like, how many am I going to rack up before we finally hit like the magic number of like, we're done. We don't need any more, like we're good and everything. So it's just kind of, it's like, you're kind of in, in the middle and yeah. stuff. Yeah. And is it, it's, so it's 44 chronic illnesses you have, Morgan. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah. um, yeah, it started with my nervous system and then went all the way through most of my organs and stuff. And just in one way or another, something's affected uh, by some disease and stuff. Yeah. So, so how, how many have you been diagnosed this year? Um, so in the last, so I only had one going into my national Jewish appointment three years ago. And then I got diagnosed with 33 more over the last three years and 12 of them came this year I think so okay. yeah okay yeah so yeah like like yeah you, you you're breaking records here but not good records but no. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say you, you might get in in like the you know that like there's a, a, a like a book up there where like, oh, people break records but I, like it's crazy just to think like like you, you get them quite quite frequently um but um hopefully it stays at 34 for a while and doesn't go to 35 yeah i hope so I hope but if we get 35 we're throwing a double party so <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you have to let me know when it is if there is one hopefully not. y'all are invited yeah. <laughs> i was about to say i need that invite yeah everybody's getting an invite are you kidding me this is gonna be great <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um but um, but guys, just to finish off, I'm I'm going to go to all of you again, and just going to ask if you have any advice, maybe um, about like um, chronic illness, um, or any last words that you you want to say before we go. Um, I'm going to go the other way around this time, so I'm going to start with Harrison, and then we'll we'll go from Harrison onwards. Yeah. So the advice I have, my last, you know, say so for the episode would be, um, you know. Love is number one. I enjoy all the moments. Uh, you know, never take anything for granted. Um, you know, surround yourself with good people, eat good food, and um, yeah, just keep shining. 
great advice there, Harrison. And again, thank you for sharing your story. I, and like, because it has been really emotional on your part, uh, <laughs> um, like about, about your story and uh, like um, about 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 your mum and, and your friend as well. So thank you for that. Um, thank you, Harrison. Um, Jess. Yeah, I just want to say that um, you're not alone in your journey. Even though we have different chronic illnesses, you're not alone. Um, social media, it can be something. Um, but if you go and find, there are people out there, kind of like Kimberly was saying, if you put your story out there and, and find them, you'll find groups like this, different people on social media, even just searching your disease as a keyword, you'll find it in other people's handles and and um, things like that. So um, just knowing you're not alone and surrounding yourself with people that you know um, you can share your story with um, can do wonders for your mental health. So just know you're not alone and there'll always be people there. Whether you know them in person or know them over over your phone, they're, they're still there for you. Definitely. Um, I, I, like you say about social media, it can be really hard as well um, to be involved in that all the time. But um, but yeah, I, I completely agree. It's also, like, like you say, search, search your um, chronic illness. So in your case, Jess, and my case, Crohn's. And then you see all these all these people popping up, which is, is, is really crazy. <laughs> um, so thank thank you again, Jess. It's, 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 it's been great. Um, Morgan. Yeah, um, I definitely think my best advice would be surround yourself with those who, like what Jess was saying, just that, like, you need to surround yourself with people who are good for you and good that feed your soul in a good way um, and everything. But also if you are having a bad day, a good cry in the shower with some sad songs does wonders. And then when you walk out of that shower, you're a whole new person. So, you know, allow yourself to feel those feelings and everything, but then don't stay stuck in those feelings as well. Definitely. I, I completely agree with them. I agree there, Morgan. Just have a nice sing song in the shower, scream all your emotions out. I think that's a really good way. Like if you don't like to do like spin back crying early, if you don't want to do those emotions in person to people, just do it in the show. I have a like um a good sing song. Um, I also love your um letter to Santa in the background like box there, uh, Morgan, because I know Christmas is coming up, so <laughs> I'm gonna be hospitalized again. So I was like, we're decorating for Christmas right after Halloween. So yeah. I just like went nuts. Christmas trees up. All the Christmas trees are up. Like oh yeah. We went crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, 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 I love that. Um, yeah, because it's crazy. The year's going so fast. Um, it is. Um, Ella? Yeah, my advice is to not be, don't be afraid of people's judgment. And I think that that kind of is, it's a, it's broad, but, you know, I think it applies to, when we're afraid to share our story about our illness, when we're afraid to let other people know about it because we're afraid that we're going to be, you know, ostracized or excluded or judged or, you know, treated differently. Um, and that's something that I dealt with a lot growing up with cystic fibrosis. And if I could, you know, tell my younger self or, you know, go back and do it differently, I would be uh, more comfortable with accepting um, you know, who I was and, and how CF has shaped and defined my life, because I have found, you know, through my advocacy and just through sharing my experiences and, you know, being the self-advocate that I am, I realize that many people are so supportive and just want to help. And really, even if they're asking questions or maybe they're just curious um, about, about learning more about your condition and really, you know, I, I, I think it's, you know, I don't want to say it's celebrated, but it's, 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 you know, it's acknowledged. And I think that it's mostly for me has been very positive. And I think many people would say the same. So that would be my advice is to embrace who, you know, who you are and what life has given you and, um, you know, make, make the most of it and also be open to sharing that experience with other people. I, I, I completely agree. And again, all love hearts going around. So I know everyone else does too. <laughs> but thank you for that, Ella. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you've enjoyed it, um, like everyone else. Um, and Kimberly, um, go to you. 
Yes. My advice would be speak kindly to yourself because I feel like, yeah, like growing up, I did feel judged. And, you know, that, I mean, those words or those thoughts, like they have nothing to do with you. That's, I always say, like, that's deflecting on someone else's opinion. And it's so important to achieve self love because only you know what you're going through. And, you know, if God, the universe, whatever you believe in, felt like you were strong enough to take this then you have to show up for yourself because no one else is going to do it for you i i definitely agree kimberly um yeah and self-love is it's very important i think I, like, that's a great way to like to finish it off because so, like we all love ourselves and we think we're all but uh, um to, to try and just self-care as well is is is, is really important um but um to, to anyone listening and, and watching, I hope you've enjoyed this like talk between some really great people. Um, this episode is actually going to be the last episode of the Community United series because I thought it's a really good way to, to finish it off with people with um, different cro- chronic illnesses, which is, is, is really cool. And I think we've all learned something today from everyone's um, story because we all have different cr- chronic illnesses. Um, but yeah, um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and, and yeah, I'm I'm glad everyone else here has enjoyed it because I know it's been a really an emotional episode, um, and um, with, with with certain things said which have been really personal to each and every one of us. But um, I'm glad everyone's enjoyed it, and um, I hope you have a nice rest of your day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. See ya. Bye. 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 <laughs>